Welcome back to At Home with the Dogginses. Hello, friends. Uh, so this is an episode where I will be doing most of the talking. <laughs> because it's about one of my hyperfixations that Allie is patient with my obsession with. <laughs> True. <laughs> so today, as we were recording this, it is Monday, April 4th. And I woke up this morning, uh, and I finished the editing on the episode that I was planning on having going up tomorrow, but uh, if I edit this one quickly, this one is going <laughs> to be the one you're hearing instead. And I, I believe in you, baby. You got this. I guess you will all know by the time you're hearing this if this is if the thing we're talking about is a week out of date information or not, or if it's our first ever actual topical episode. Baby, I know you and your hyperfixations. If you try hard enough, you'll be able to push it out. Come rain or come shine. Well, here's hoping, because, um, so I woke up putting the finishing touches on what was supposed to be this week's episode, and I always uh, set it so that all social media is blocked, so that I'm not distracted by Twitter and Facebook first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's true. And can actually get things done. So I did not look at social media at all while I was putting the finishing touches on the episode that I was finishing. And I was like, okay, great. I'm done faster than I expected. I can look at Twitter on my phone. What I see when I look at Twitter is multiple people tweeting at me <laughs> news that I missed. And that is that this morning they dropped a teaser for a new Monkey Island game. Yay! <laughs> developed by Ron Gilbert. <laughs> Double A. Now, the part of this that means anything to my wife is just Monkey Island Game because she knows that as a brand I am obsessed with. You've been playing it with Charlie Marlowe on live streams the last couple times, so I, I'm aware of it on that end. It's true. I did a stream where I unboxed, I got from Limited Run Games, the uh, Monkey Island Anthology, all of the games thus far in this gorgeous, big, bulky box with... Tons of bonus content, Guybrush statue, Murray the Talking Skull candle holder, and a coffee table book that's an oral history of all the games that I still haven't finished reading yet, but I've been uh, browsing through, and it's full of just so many great stories. Some of them I had heard versions of before, some of them I hadn't. But uh, basically, the purpose of this episode is for me to explain to Allie, and by extension to the listeners who don't know, why this is all very exciting. I'm just waiting inevitably for Supiaki to just say, fuck it, we'll make a Monkey Island mug so that I can get that for you later for your birthday this year. So <laughs> There we go, to, to match the Muppet mug I am currently drinking tea out of. That's the only reason why I just said that right now. I was like, ah, that mug, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Well, I mean, many people have tweeted their excitement from Felicia Day to Elijah Wood. So <laughs> so the Monkey Island fandom might go farther than anyone expected. <laughs> so basically, Secret of Monkey Island, point-and-click adventure game made by LucasArts in 1990. Uh, head developer was Ron Gilbert, and then uh, Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman were the other writers. And what has come to light in a lot of the behind-the-scenes information was uh, they were sort of figuring out the tone of it as they went. And there were a lot of, like, dialogue options that Dave and Tim put in that they thought were just going to be temp dialogue. So they just put goofy jokes in there. Mm -hmm. And then that just ended up being the final dialogue. <laughs> so it has a very, you know, spoofy, cartoony tone. L little Mel Brooks, Little Monty Python, Little Zucker Abrams Zucker. uh mm -hmm. Very spoofy, very cartoony, but the narrative tone, the story of the game was inspired by the book On Stranger Tides by Tim Powers, uh, which I've never read, but I've... The Pirates of the Caribbean movie? It, it was later adapted into a Pirates of the Caribbean. B basically, we'll get to that in a second. And Wild. I made a video probably like 15 years ago or something breaking down this very complicated thread. Okay. But basically... uh, uh. There's this book on Stranger Tides about, I, I believe it's about Blackbeard. Again, I've never read it. And that sort of inspired the story. And the aesthetic of the game was inspired by Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean. So where does our flag means death fit into all of this? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, it proves pirates are zeitgeisty enough to have come back to this franchise. Right. Um we will be talking about the TV show at some point. At some point, yes. Uh, we have several episodes locked and loaded about just shows we've been watching. Yeah. 
Um, uh, Criterion series, you just to let everybody know, is dead for the time being until we have It's not them. dead. It's resting. It's resting. <laughs> it's pining for the fjords. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once uh, once finances uh, clear up a bit, we will resubscribe to Criterion, and that one can come back. But I'd like uh, to donate to coffee.com slash Doggins. You can help with that. That's coffee.com slash Doggins. Again, the people listening to this are the ones who are already giving us money. <laughs> oh, I forget about that, yeah. <laughs> Until we release this as a free episode like three years from now or something. True, true. Uh, Like we did uh, just this week with the uh, Sesame Street episode. Oh, that did happen today. Yeah. Um, Yesterday. Or yesterday. I have no sense of time anymore. You should know this. (laughs) Well, of course not. And nor do any of us. Um, But basically, uh, the tone was basically taking from these two things uh like ron gilbert has talked about how like the desire while riding pirates as a kid to get off the boat and explore the world was one of the things in the back of his mind when he was uh developing the first monkey island game and also the story was inspired by this book on stranger tides now years later obviously disney adapted the pirates of the caribbean brand into a movie franchise Mm -hmm. And I cannot remember which of the screenwriters, but it's either Ted Elliott or Terry Rossio had earlier been commissioned to write a draft of an unmade Monkey Island movie. Wild. Which one's the anti-vaxxer again? I can never remember. Okay. I do not know the difference between Ted and Terry offhand. Okay. But, uh... I like to imagine them as some sort of two-headed being. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. Mm. Um, but, uh, so Ted and Terry... One of them, at one point, worked on a draft of a Monkey Island movie that never got made. So there has long been rampant speculation that the Pirates movies draw from this unmade Monkey Island movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Since Monkey Island drew so much aesthetically from Pirates. In fact, there is a puzzle in Monkey Island 2 where you are in a jail cell and you need to figure out how to get a bone. Mm Mm-hmm. To tempt a dog to bring you the key. That is the most explicit reference to the of ride of course. in the first two games. Uh, the third game, then, which we'll get to in a moment, the third game piled on other sort of general Disneyland references. Uh, but that's the most explicit, direct, we're just doing a scene from the ride Pirates of the Caribbean mm-hmm. in the first game. Um, or or in, in, in the first two games. So yeah, then eventually when they were making sequels to those first three Pirates movies, for one of them, they just bought the rights to the book on Stranger Tides. Mm -hmm. So as I described in the past, on Stranger Tides, maybe the first ever movie that is inspired by a book, inspired by a ride, and inspired by an unmade movie that was inspired by a game that was inspired by that same book and ride. That's wild. (laughs) It is. It's a lot to unpack. But so um, the first two Monkey Island games were made by Ron Gilbert, uh, Dave Grossman, Tim Schaefer. A couple other uh, programmers and writers were brought on for the second one. And then they did not get around to making a third one before those guys all left LucasArts. And based on the way they describe it in the book that came with the limited run games package, which which is a book that I hope they make available again somewhere else in the future because Mm -hmm. it's a great read. And I would hate to think that the entire Monkey Island fandom who could not afford the hundred something dollars to buy this collection is missing out on getting their hands on this book forever. I wouldn't be surprised if like in a few years they'll like do it as like a standalone coffee book for like 40 bucks or something, you know, or even as like a Kindle release. I don't know, Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's, it's a great oral history. Um, from the sounds of it, from the oral history, it wasn't like any sort of, it wasn't like any specific bad blood or anything. It was just like when they made the first two Monkey Island games, the corporate structure at Lucas Arts, which is Lucasfilm's games division, was a lot looser. And it was basically like Lucas Arts wasn't really making Lucasfilm, the company, that much money. But because it was all George Lucas and just whatever he wanted to have happen could happen, Mm -hmm. George Lucas was just like, yeah, you you know, just uh, keep the games going. Just keep on making the games because it's it's fun that we make games. And 
by all accounts, he was never really hands-on with the games department. He didn't really play games. Apparently, he had to be told by Steven Spielberg that he has a cameo in the first Monkey Island game. <laughs> sure. Because <laughs> Spielberg actually is a gamer. Because why else would he have said, yes, I will make Ready Player One? Yeah, yeah. But Lucas, I think, just liked using the money he made from other stuff to support creative people doing creative things. And like, say what you will about Lucas as a creative, and believe me, I have, but like Lucas as a mogul, like... George Lucas is the closest we have to like a Renaissance patron who just gives people money to do <laughs> shit. You know that that poster that that post that goes around about like you know let yeah. let's collect feral artists again. Basically, <laughs> yes, exactly. He is very much living that 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 moment right now, and it's like bless his heart. He 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 does the thing. <laughs> he was also in weird ways like the closest modern Hollywood had to, like, a Howard Hughes. Kind of, yeah. Just weird in very different ways than Howard Hughes was weird. That's clean on, Kleenex boxes on the feet, you know? Like, yeah. Not not to, like, compare him personally to Howard Hughes as a person, but just in terms of, here's this strange man who does his own thing and is rich enough to do whatever he wants yeah. and fund whatever he wants. It's, it's him and Roland Endrick. Or <laughs> Ud- yeah, and Udo Kier. Like, <laughs> not Udo Kier. You know which one I'm talking about. Uwe Boll? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, but anyway, basically by the time the third game was made, corporate structure at LucasArts had changed so much, and it was no longer just a bunch of fun people in an office. Like The way they describe it is like the way those early Pixar documentaries show Pixar being like, because they don't have the camera rolling when, uh, when Lassiter's getting too handsy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the way they make it look like it's fun. We have paper airplane contests and everybody gets to pitch ideas, but like even smaller than Pixar at that era. So it was just really a handful of people in offices playing around with computers, figuring it out as they went. They talked about like whenever the LucasArts guys would go over to like the the ILM wing of the ranch. And of course, ILM was like the cool rich kids because they were like doing the real work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and ju- just like the interesting high school clickery of it all. But like all the LucasArts people were like, we're just making creative. It was a snapshot of a time where LucasArts, for whatever reason, was not allowed to make Star Wars projects. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's just that the Star Wars licenses had already been signed away to other studios or if George just said don't do Star Wars for a while Mm -hmm. so LucasArts at that time made those two great Indiana Jones games that I made a video about years ago but they weren't doing Star Wars projects which is nice and refreshing considering like in the last handful of years of LucasArts life before Disney shut down LucasArts all they were doing was putting their name on Star Wars projects Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, after a while, LucasArts was growing and growing, and it was no longer, like, the fun, collaborative, creative atmosphere that mm-hmm. uh, that led to the first two Monkey Island games. So most of the people who worked on those games had left the company by the time a third Monkey Island game was greenlit. So it was uh, a completely different team making Monkey Island 3, Curse of Monkey Island. Okay. Curse of Monkey Island came out several years after the first two, uh, and it took a lot of leaps forward. It was the first one with voice acting, not Mm -hmm. just text on the screen, and it had higher resolution graphics, which meant that they did this hand-drawn animated style Mm -hmm. that I mostly like, even though I don't love all of the character designs. Okay. But uh, uh, very much like they were trying to make it look like a cartoon movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, fully voice acted, perfect cast, uh, I think. Not a lot of celebrity voice actors, couple of known names. There is a very peculiar cameo where one character is voiced by Gary Coleman. Sure, okay. <laughs> there is another less peculiar but also very exciting cameo where there is not even a cameo. It's a supporting role. There is a character, a Scottish pirate voiced by Alan Young doing the Scrooge McDuck voice. Oh, that's awesome. And that is so much fun. That is rad. Um, 
And then there's just a lot of, like, working voice actors throughout the whole thing. Um, but for the two main roles, Guybrush Threepwood, the main character, is played by an actor named Dominic Armato, who did not have a whole lot of voiceover experience at the time. Mm-hmm. But he was starting to get into doing voice work. And he was also a huge fan of the first two games. So, like, he knew the character inside out. Cool. And the first time I played the third one, after having only played the first two with uh, with no voice acting, the first time I heard him speak, like, I'm sure not everyone had this experience. But for me, I was like... This is the exact voice I was imagining for this guy. Mm-hmm. And he, it, it, it's like an earnest young guy. Like, it, it's a nondescript voice, but it, it is immediately recognizable. Um, and then LeChuck, the evil ghost pirate, is voiced by character actor Earl Bowen, who is most known as the uh, psychiatrist from the first three Terminator movies. Oh, okay. Um, and from that role, you would not know that he has this performance in him, but he just does this great evil pirate voice that he has so much resonance in his voice, such a great growl and such like great menace to him, but also just like good quirk and humor to it. Mm-hmm. And like, he's perfect. He's perfect. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll get to more thoughts on him in a moment. But uh, one of the big sticking points is that the ending of Monkey Island 2 ended with all these twist reveals that uh, sort of recontextualize a lot of things if you take them seriously, Mm -hmm. which is a big if. But basically, at the end of Monkey Island 2, LeChuck says to Guybrush, I am your brother. And the whole scene is like a spoof of the I am your father scene from Star Wars, from yeah. Empire. And then the reveal is that uh, they are just children playing in a carnival, imagining that they are pirates. Mm-hmm. But then as they go on about the carnival, uh, the brother Chucky, who was playing LeChuck, gets this, like, evil look in his eye, like, like this sort of evil spell. So it's like, people were like, well, how are they going to unpack that? How are they, how are they going to, uh, like, like what, what are they going to do? Like, how does that change the story? Uh-huh. Now, years later, when they did the special edition of the first two games, and they did a commentary on the second game, Ron, Dave, and Tim basically said, yeah, we were just, like, doing joke twist endings <laughs> like uh. so uh they've said other things at various points that cause doubt on that but basically the takeaway i had was that the audience was taking that twist ending way more seriously than the writers were uh-huh. um but uh curse of monkey island towards the end of the game sort of recontextualizes all that and retcons that to be uh that the carnival was a curse that made like it was a the carnival of the damned and it was a spell put on Guybrush that made him think he's just a kid Mm -hmm. and like just this utterly convoluted backstory when probably just ignoring the ending would have been the better move yeah but uh it, it gets a little lore heavy at the end of curse and i think i think the ending of curse is the weakest stuff in that particular game But other than that, Curse is a game I greatly enjoy. Um, Now, a while after that, they made Escape from Monkey Island, which is the most frustrating game in the series. Uh, Dominic Armado is back uh, as Guybrush, and he's still great. Uh, Earl Bowen is back as LeChuck. He's still great. A couple of other voices have been recast, but some of the other characters are back. Um... But it was the first one made with 3D animation, like like mm-hmm. as all games were at the time. Yeah. And it looks hideous. <laughs> I can imagine. The the it, it came out, I think, in 2000. Mm. And the 2000 era graphics are atrocious. Uh, on top of which, the gameplay is tedious and clunky. It was not a point and click the way the first three were because it was 
being released at the same time on computers and on PlayStation. Mm. And they clearly designed it for a PlayStation controller and then did not... Uh, do the same for the the computer. Yeah, exactly. So it's these really awkward keyboard controls. And it is... It's honestly very similar to the controls in the Phantom Menace game that Nick and I played a lot when we were young. But uh, the thing that the Phantom Menace game did is that the camera actually followed the character, so the controls were more intuitive. Uh, Escape from Monkey Island is all locked down camera angles, and pressing up on the keyboard makes Guybrush walk forward in the direction he's facing, not in the direction the camera is facing. Mm -hmm. And that is just really awkward and clunky. And there are like three or four puzzles I like in Escape. There are a couple of jokes I like in Escape. And there is one music cue I love in Escape. And that is uh, when you go to this sort of touristy island with all these hip businesses, one of them is a micro groggery. Mm -hmm. And the music for the micro groggery is this sort of hip, up-tempo, swinging version of LeChuck's theme mm -hmm. that might be the catchiest piece of music in the entire series. And I love it, but mm -hmm. uh, that is basically all I love about this game. On top of which, there were even more retcons piled on. There is a character who shows up in the first two games, a castaway named Herman Toothrot, and... In Escape, for reasons I cannot even begin to fathom, they decided to retcon it so that Herman Toothrot is Elaine's grandfather, despite them previously being established as separate characters. Sure, okay. And it's it's a dumb twist for twist's sake, and I don't think anybody likes it. Mm. Um, but uh, then after Escape, the franchise was kind of dead for a while. Mm -hmm. LucasArts wasn't doing anything that wasn't Star Wars. Uh, then in 2009, something happened. Mm -hmm. And that is LucasArts announced out of nowhere that they'd released the special edition of the original Secret of Monkey Island. And they were working with Telltale to make Tales of Monkey Island. Oh. And this caught everyone by surprise. Nobody expected a new Monkey Island game to ever happen. Mm -hmm. um, and people were... And this is before Telltale went to hell, right? Yes, this was back when, by all accounts, Telltale was a fun place to work, much like how LucasArts used to be a fun place to mm -hmm. work. Um, this, was, this was honestly probably Telltale at their peak. Like, this was the moment this was the most exciting possible news uh, like, this was when Telltale was, like, bringing back adventure games. Like, they had done the first two Sam and Max seasons, and some people had their qualms with them, but broadly speaking, they were well accepted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, everyone was excited to see what Telltale would do with Monkey Island, especially because one of the people working at Telltale at the time was Dave Grossman, who had worked on the first two games. Mm. Now, Ron Gilbert wasn't working at Telltale. He was at uh, a different studio at the time, but he was brought in as a consultant for okay. Tales. Uh, so he basically, like, the exact degree to which he was involved in the writing and development has never fully been revealed, unless it's in a part of the book that I haven't gotten to yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, by all accounts, he basically met with the Telltale writers to basically lay down, okay, here's the characters as I see them. Here's the type of places a story with these characters can go. Mm -hmm. And yeah, again, one of the original writers was working on a Monkey Island game again, so that was exciting. And uh, I've told this story a couple times publicly recently, but um, 2009 happened to be the summer I was in LA for my internship program. Mm -hmm. And one day LucasArts tweeted... Uh, E3 was going on, and LucasArts tweeted, we will be out in the lobby giving out Monkey Island swag if anyone's there. Oh, very cool. And and I was like, okay, I am not, I don't have an E3 badge, but I can drive across town to the LA Convention Center and just walk into the lobby in hopes of getting a t-shirt and some posters. And I did exactly that. 
And I still have my I Found the Treasure of Melee Island t-shirt that I got from that swag. You wear it regularly. I It, it is still in my regular t-shirt rotation. Uh, I wore it on my most recent Monkey Island stream with Charlie Marlowe. <laughs> so again, the fact that Ron Gilbert was consulting on Tales, people wondered what this meant because like there was sort of a schism in the Monkey Island fandom, mm-hmm. much as there is in any fandom. Of course. Of any course. fandom is going to have its purists. Mm-hmm. And there were people in the fandom who were like, only the first two games are canon because those are the only ones Ron worked on. Uh-huh. And then there were those of us who were like, we'll just keep playing the games and if they're fun, we'll like them. Yeah. And, uh... People who weren't purists were like saying to the purists, look, Ron's involved. Doesn't that make you happy? And the purists are like, well, we'll wait and see. Mm -hmm. And of course, anyone who didn't like Tails was like, well, clearly they didn't actually listen to Ron. Mm -hmm. Because there's that weird thing in purist fandom circles where it's like they decide who the heroes and the villains of the creatives are. And if a creative decision is made that they don't like, it can't possibly be that someone they worship made a choice they disagree with. It's like, no, somebody made them make that choice. (laughs) And vice versa. If there's something they like, it couldn't possibly be that the villain uh, in their mind had anything to do with it. It's it's like, no, they made the Mandalorian behind Kathleen Kennedy's back somehow. (laughs) Ah, fandoms are stupid. But... (laughs) Yep. Anyway, I played Tales of Monkey Island, and it was not my favorite of the Monkey Island games, but it had some of my favorite storytelling. Mm -hmm. So one of the big schisms in the purist fandom, basically, is in Secret of Monkey Island, Guybrush has this crush on Elaine, and they sort of ambiguously get together at the end. Then in Monkey Island 2... They apparently had a very bad breakup. Mm. And it's more a source of humor than anything else. Like, it's awkward because you have to run into a lane again. Of course. Curse of Monkey Island, made after Ron left, basically says Elaine still has feelings for Guybrush. At the end of that one, they get married. And Ron Gilbert had said offhandedly, eh, I don't think I would have had Guybrush and Elaine get married. Mm-hmm. Uh and so a lot of people are like, like their wedding is not canon or whatever. But, and I was kind of of the mind that it's like, I don't mind that they had them get married, but I do agree that the relationship established in the first two games does not quite gel with the relationship as sure. portrayed in the third game. Sure. And then the fourth game, I barely remember what happens in the narrative. Uh, but when Tales came out, it had this whole uh, thing going where it's like Guybrush and Elaine are still married, but there's like potential sources of tension there because in the beginning of the first chapter, through complicated magic, LeChuck becomes human. And when he becomes human, he no longer seems to be evil. Mm-hmm. And so Elaine and LeChuck are off doing this thing. And there's like this potential, uh-oh, is LeChuck going to get between Guybrush and Elaine? Mm-hmm. And then there's this other uh, girl who seems to be pining for Guybrush. And it's like, is there going to be trouble in paradise? And it becomes clear, uh, spoilers for Tales of Monkey Island, I guess. Mm-hmm. But it becomes clear at the end of chapter four that... LeChuck was just faking being good. He had this long-running evil plan. Of course. And uh, LeChuck, at the end of Chapter 4, straight up murders Guybrush. Sure, okay. Chapter 5, Guybrush is in the underworld. Okay. And Ron Gilbert had said elsewhere that his original idea for Monkey Island 3 was Guybrush Threepwood in Hell. Mm -hmm. So this seems to be one of the things they got from Ron. Okay, yeah. But basically, in that murder scene, like, during all that, like, Elaine and Guybrush's dynamic there, it's like, without just repeating everything that happens in the scene, that was the moment where I was like, okay, I'm on board with Guybrush and Elaine as a couple. Mm -hmm. Because, uh... Like, the actors play the scene so well, and and uh, the the heartbreak is palpable as, like, she holds the dying Guybrush in her arms. Yeah. And it's like, 
shockingly emotional for a Monkey Island game. Yeah. Um, the other extra bit of emotion was... So by the time 2009 came around, Earl Bowen, who had played LeChuck in 3 and 4, was retired. Mm -hmm. They managed to get him out of retirement to do the special editions. Okay. Uh, But when they did the first chapter of Tales, they couldn't get him. So it's another guy doing the voice of Demon LeChuck at the beginning. It's yet another guy doing human LeChuck throughout the next handful of chapters. Mm -hmm. And, but that, like, that's a distinct character, sort of. So that one's fine. Yeah. And, like, no disrespect to the guy who was doing LeChuck at the beginning of chapter one, but it was huge fucking shoes to fill, and he did not quite fill those shoes. Okay. And, like, one of the criticisms people had about, uh, that first chapter was like, yeah, the, the LeChuck voice isn't great. Mm-hmm. But then in that final scene of chapter four, when LeChuck stabs Guybrush and then absorbs this voodoo spell that's going on so he can be his full demon form again, mm-hmm. then his next line, by that point, they got Earl Bowen, so it's his voice again. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, not only is evil LeChuck back, but like the evil LeChuck we all remember is back. Yeah, yeah. And it was very... Uh, <laughs> Very intense for the fandom. Um, I do not know if they if they managed to get Earl Bowen back for this new game or not, but uh, I guess we'll find out one way or the other. I'm just imagining that the cheers for when that happened on the, every individual person's screen playing it was the same for that moment in Endgame. When, like, <laughs> yeah, bitch! Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> just lay the Endgame audio over the end of... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it was complicated emotions because we were also like... Like, what does this mean now that Guybrush is dead? (laughs) But, uh, I think some, I think I remember some people even wondering, so are we going to play as Elaine in the next chapter? Which I would have been okay with, but, uh, I was also okay with just being undead afterlife Guybrush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fun. Um, so that's the Monkey Island series as it exists so far. And basically the first two games made by Ron Gilbert, third and fourth game not made by Ron Gilbert, and then Tails made by people who were at least talking to Ron Gilbert. Uh Much like Star Wars, much like every fandom, people argue over which games count. Of course. So the fact that it was announced this morning that not only is there a new Monkey Island game, but Ron Gilbert is doing it, that this is apparently what they've been spending the pandemic doing... That is uh, wild and exciting. Fantastic. And it could mean any number of things. Um, Now... What are your theories, love? Well, I don't know. See, here's the thing. In 2013, Ron Gilbert did a post on his blog, Grumpy Gamer, called If I Made Another Monkey Island. And he was making it abundantly clear in this post, I'm not making another Monkey Island. I don't expect I ever will make another Monkey Island. Disney owns Monkey Island now. They're not planning on doing anything with it Mm -hmm. so i but he just did a post like the things he would do with a monkey island game if he were able to do it again like like he said all these things about i would want it to be like a retro game 2d art not a not a modern 3d game Mm -hmm. uh i would want all these things uh and one of the points he made was uh it would be called monkey island 3a uh all the games after monkey island 2 don't count. And he later had to clarify, look, I really did like Curse of Monkey Island. I thought it was a great game, but the story I want to tell goes in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But one of the other points he made was it would not be the same game, the same Monkey Island 3 I was going to make in 1992. I'm not the same person I was back then. I could never make that game now. Hopefully this one would be better. And another thing he said was, the only way I would or could make another Monkey Island is if I owned the IP. I've spent too much of my life creating and making things other people own. And uh, that's actually danced around in the teaser that was released this morning. Because basically the teaser this morning, it's on a pirate dock. There is a ghost skeleton pirate with a fiddle playing LeChuck's theme. Mm -hmm. Another ghost skeleton pirate starts bringing out all these crates Mm-hmm. And uh, Murray the Skull, who is a character who was introduced in Curse of Monkey Island. So mm-hmm. he only exists in the non-Ron games, but he was like the fan favorite character from that game. Mm-hmm. 
but Murray is watching this pirate bring out these crates, and the crates have the different studios on them. And so the first crate says Lucasfilm Games. The second crate says Devolver Digital. And then the third crate that the skeleton brings out says Terrible Toy Box. And then it fades on top of it, Ron Gilbert's Terrible Toy Box. Like, Mm -hmm. they are really building to the fact that Ron is still involved in this game. And Murray then goes to the... uh, to the fiddling skeleton and says, says, but Ron told me he wouldn't make another Monkey Island game unless, and then the fiddler just knocks him into the water. Nice. And then they reveal Return to Monkey Island, written by Ron Gilbert and Dave Grossman. Tim Schafer is presumably busy with other successful games he is (laughs) working on. Yeah. And they reveal uh, the original musicians from the first game are back. And Dominic Armado is back as Guybrush Threepwood. Cool. Which is great. Like, Dominic played Guybrush in every game that has voice acting, including these special editions of the first two. Dominic is great as Guybrush. And he's not even a full-time voice actor anymore. Like, he... I, I think he did like a culinary review thing for a while. Like, okay. like Like, most of his tweets are about, like, cooking and stuff with the, the occasional tweet about monkey island say more <laughs> <laughs> yes i i think you and dominic armado would probably get along right, cool. <laughs> um, but uh they still say you know copyright lucasfilm all over that so clearly disney did not just sell him back the ip mm-hmm. but i guess he just got a deal where he still gets full creative freedom over it or at, at least enough creative freedom that he's comfortable with and or he's just changed his mind in the nine years since that blog post. You know, lot can happen. Which raises questions about what else won't be true anymore about that blog. It does look like it's still 2D art, but uh, one of the things is one of the studios making the game tweeted it's picking up right where Monkey Island 2 ended with the mm-hmm. carnival twist ending. So a lot of people are like... You know, the purists are all like, yes, we're finally getting the real Monkey Island 3. And the people who liked the sequels are like, oh, but I liked the sequels. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of, you know, like, I liked things in the sequels, even if I didn't like other things in them. But then Ron also tweeted this. Uh, Somebody replied to him, I'm sad to see Monkey Island 3 going out of canon, but I couldn't be happier with the news. Ron replied to this person saying... Monkey Island 3 doesn't go out of canon. We were very careful about that. Okay. Murray is in this game. And now I'm really curious. My best theory is that this is going to be an in-between quill. Uh, because one of the other things Ron had said in the past was, like, maybe you would find that my Monkey Island 3 would slot in nicely between 2 and 3. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking this is set between Monkey Island 2 and 3 somehow. Mm -hmm. Because, again, he was said we were very careful about Monkey Island 3 still being canon. But if Murray is in the game, Guybrush doesn't meet Murray until Monkey Island 3, so I am not sure. Unless, like, Murray and Guybrush just never encounter each other, or they just only pay slight attention to continuity. They they do the Futurama rule of continuity, where Mm. only follow it when it's funnier than ignoring it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh... At the moment, I see no reason not to be excited about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope it's released for Switch because uh, that's our the most... only real system we have. <laughs> that's our only console and that's our most reliable gaming platform. It could maybe, like, if it works on Mac, I can roll with that, but... Uh, if I eventually get an Alienware computer, then we'll give it a shot on there. Because to... you also haven't played the other game yet because it's... Uh not compatible for mac right i haven't played uh i can't get uh escape or tales to work in crossover on my mac okay yeah and uh like i've played them before but like as i'm doing the streams by the time i get to them i'm uh, not sure i'm gonna handle that and i haven't played that new king's quest game that came out a few years ago uh it, it's like i have enough games that i want to play that i can't but not enough to actually warrant spending money on a gaming computer valid And, uh, I mean, the whole reason we're doing this podcast is because I do not have time to have unmonetizable hobbies. Mm -hmm, So my thoughts about a new Monkey Island have to become content one way or the other. Uh, but anyway, um, 
the most you've seen of a Monkey Island game is when you came in while I was streaming the first one. You made me play a little bit of it, I think. Uh, I had you do voices for a character. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Um, but I, I think you would enjoy the games, and I think when you feel like it, you should play them at your own pace. I, I would like to play them not in front of an audience. Like, that is my... We don't, we don't have to stream you. You're allowed to have non-monetizable hobbies. Yeah, I know, I know. That's like I'm saying, when I went up to it, I would like to do it on my own terms, not with commentary. <laughs> You have been watching me uh, play Sam and Max a little bit, and you've occasionally, when I couldn't remember the solution to a puzzle, you have occasionally been the one at Google reminding me how it goes. No, of course, of course. Um, but yeah, uh, I love these games. I'm excited for the new one. I am happy that Ron is... Uh, not just dismissing all the games he didn't work on. Yeah, yeah, no, it's like, I think it's a sign of a somebody who has a healthy relationship to a project to not, like, curse out everything else about it. I also think, again, it's a thing where, like, I think he does have a lot of love for Monkey Island. I, I think he does take it seriously, but I do think it's a case where his fans took it so much more seriously than he did all this time. While I did not work the show at the Smithsonian, not to bring out my old career again, I did go see the video game show that happened at um, the Smithsonian a few years back that included a big portion of it dedicated to uh, Monkey Island. Hmm. And the the amount of arguing and bitching that would happen in front of that cabinet about like whether three was worth it or whatever, and I had no idea what the heck was going on. I was just like, that's a pretty monkey. Uh, <laughs> It was just kind of like, wow, people who really like this game seem to really like this game. <laughs> they have feelings, kind of with a capital F. So uh, it's it's yeah, I can I can just say even from like witnessing a museum exhibition about it, people have the feelings about this thing. I'm excited for this pattern of basically every ten to twelve years, there's a new development in Monkey Island. Hey, it works. It works. <laughs> uh. I've been talking about on the stream that a long time ago I was fan casting the live action Monkey Island movie Naturally. frequently. And it's like, uh, for a long time, even though he'd be uh, way too old for it now, for a long time, Neil Patrick Harris was all I could see as Guybrush. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could list all the other characters, but that would mean even less to you than everything else I've been saying. Tom Holland? He, he wouldn't be terrible. Um, we know the man can sing, can dance, can be a fancy pants just the way that Mr. Neil Patrick Harris can be, so... Yeah. He would, he would not be a bad fit. Anyway, all the teaser said is that this game is coming in, quote, 2022. So, we'll find out when. When we get a date, Dave will probably get a day of and have a, a live stream of uh, his initial reactions of the thing. One of the other things Ron said in his original post is that he did not want, uh, if he makes Monkey Island 3, he does not want to release it to press beforehand. He he wants... Uh, no, no crunching, which is good. Yeah, and, and he wants the critics to play it at the same time the fans play it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if that's something he has call over <laughs> in this. Like, again, I don't know how many of those points still apply, but uh, it'll be nice to know that as long as I play it opening day, I shouldn't get spoiled. Boom, yeah. Um, but I am so excited to eventually, before the end of the year, play the next chapter in one of my favorite game series. Yeah. Even if I do not <laughs> know exactly yet how that chapter fits in with the others. And I'm excited for you being excited by this. I would also be fine if there was just utter disregard for continuity. <laughs> like... <laughs> like I don't, like, I like the Monkey Island lore and storytelling. I do not need it to be, like, meticulously kept on, like, a Christopher Tolkien level. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't need the Silmarillion key. I don't know. <laughs> Did you see that joke going around? It's like I was at a conference for, a, uh, somebody was at a Tolkien conference, and there was, like, a six-hour a fight about whether or not bees existed. <laughs> and then it was like, so it was like, they had mead, which means they had honey which they had, they had bees, and everybody was just disappointed that this fight just went to nowhere. <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, how did they explain Gandalf telling Bilbo that he opened the door like a pop gun? <laughs> Look, 
Listen, Linda, I've only watched the movies once, as you are well aware of. I refuse to have any more involvement with it than just the than, than just that. <laughs> you knew what you were getting into when you married me. I think I understood. I didn't realize what exactly I was getting into. <laughs> I love you. I love you, too. We'll do another episode soon enough where you babble at me about your hyperfixation. <laughs> Duly noted. All right. <laughs> Just say the word. <laughs> but until next time, this has been At Home with the Dogginses. Later days, y'all. Later days. Later days.